Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, this uh, Lexington School District 1 School Board Candidate Forum is sponsored by uh, Lexington Elementary School, Lexington Middle School, and New Providence uh, Elementary School and their School Improvement Council. So uh, we just thank you for coming. We're going to stay on task and uh, keep uh, the candidates on their toes. And we have students involved tonight, so we do appreciate you coming. I want to introduce our, moder our moderator and MC tonight, Mr. Edwin Grace. He's up here at Lexington Elementary School. Mr. Grace. Good Welcome, everyone. Um, I know you really don't want to hear from me too much, but rather from these people, so I'm going to cut it real short. The agenda for the evening is follows. I'm going to ask three questions. They're going to have about two minutes to respond. They will all answer the same question, have a chance to answer the same question. Uh, then we'll go to a final question where they'll have a minute to respond. Um, but firstly, I want to go ahead and introduce all the candidates here. Uh, and I'm going to hand the mic and we'll you know, let everyone introduce themselves real quickly. Ruthu Bonsley. Hazel Fourth Duo. Anthony Faraci. Janet Ballard Frazier. Rhonda Wanamaker Gunter. Jean Haggard. Edwin Harmon. Deborah Kelderman. Brent Powers. Cindy Smith. Ted Z. Thank you. Get right to the meat and potatoes of the whole event. Let's go. Question one from Lexington Elementary School, Emerson.
cursive. They didn't know how to write a sentence in cursive. So I think that we need to get back to some basics. But I think that all the programs should be protected, especially the arts. Thank you.
hopefully the school board will be able to come together and come up with some good choices for our district to keep our district remarkable. Thank you. this very difficult process in my career as an administrator. And I think what happens is every course and every program, uh, we have to get, look at all of them, very close scrutiny for all of them. And this is not easy, but there is a process that is in place, and I think it reviews all of the factors. I just want to go through a few of these factors. Uh, as an example, in the high school study, you would first identify those core English, math, science, and social studies courses that are required for the high school diploma. The next step would include those that are crit critical to your strategic plan, and that's where the world languages and the arts are included. I agree with everyone else. Band, orchestra, and chorus are so critical to the development of our children. Then you would consider courses that currently have low enrollments or are not prerequisites for other courses are ones that are key to obtaining a major in high school. Those would be the first ones to look at. I think the bottom line is this. We would not want cuts to endanger students not obtaining a rigorous quality education that prepares them to be college and career ready. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Let me tell you that our mission statement for Lexington School District 1 defines who we are. And our mission statement says that we are a district where academics, arts, athletics, and caring people connect. And when we get to tough budget times, I think what we need to consider is maintaining our balance. And that defines who we are as a district. That is what our character is. We've always been a district that had good balance among academics, arts, athletics. I think we need to maintain that. The real issue behind the question of cutting programs, and I'm going to tell you, I've been on the board for 12 years, and I did not sign on to cut programs. I signed on to enhance what we do and provide uh, additional opportunities for our students. And so I really hate the, the prospect of cutting programs. But the real answer behind that is to make sure that we are funded properly so that we don't have to be in that kind of situation. And that comes both from the federal level and from the state level. The state funds us right now at the same level that funded students back in 1999. That is absurd. The federal government, people talk a lot about throwing money at public education. Let me tell you, it has never happened. The federal budget, 1% of the federal budget goes to K through 12 education. And to put that in perspective, 21% goes to defense, 6% goes to paying off the interest on the national debt. So we spend, from a federal standpoint, six times more to pay off the interest on the national debt than we do for funding for K-12 education. So the real issue behind cutting programs is to making sure that, is making sure that we work with our elected officials and that they fund our programs at the levels that they have promised and at, at the levels that are appropriate for what we need to do for our students each and every day. Our programs are valuable. We've got to protect the academics. We've got to protect the arts. We've got to protect the athletics so that caring people can come together and make a difference for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. There's not one program I can think of that I would ever want to cut. If it comes to the time where we need to tighten our belts and watch our budgets, it would be the day that somebody says we have to stop having this program. With the caring parents and the students and the teachers and with the board's help, we can keep programs alive. Might have to be on a smaller dime than it was before, but there's no need to cut unless that's the last resort. Good evening, thank you for having all of us. Um, you know, I think this is a hard question, but it's a real question. I really view the role of the school district is to prepare our kids to become working, productive members of our community. 
And that's either through a continued collegiate education, preparing for college, or it's through a vocational career. Now, not as a school board trustee, it's hard for me to understand and wrap my hands around the scope of what the school district is currently doing. So to pick specific programs, I think, would be premature. But I would engage programs and activities through that filter. Does this activity allow our kids to become productive working members of our community? Now, Dr. Harmon spoke some about the, the change in funding, and maybe we're going to get to this, but Act 38, Act 388, which was passed in 2006, dramatically changed how the school district is funded. And that's part of the reason we're, we're in the trouble we are now. With the recession, the sales tax goes down. So that's, that's what happened with Act 388. The, the funding for operations moved from property tax for schools to a sales tax. Now, that's great when the economy's moving, but it's not. And so that's part of the reason we're back to 1999 funding models. So again, uh, Jermaine and Dr. Uh, Harmon's point, we need to work as a community with our legislators, with our delegates, to uh, change how schools are funded. Now that being said, I think we as a district now have to get creative on how we fund things. And we look to our community to help us with that. I know uh, when my first grader was going through the Hunter Book Club, which I think is a great program that we do at Rocky Creek, we essentially could not support the t-shirts anymore. Now the program wasn't closed because we still wanted to instill the value of reading with our first graders. That's when they first feel it and touch it. So our principal reached out to our, our community, or our parents in our school, and said, help us with this. And uh, some of us in first grade stepped forward and we paid for the t-shirts. And that's how we were able to make it happen. So I think there are creative ways to tap into the resources in our community. Thank you. Thank you for coming, and I want to thank the three uh, school improvement councils that are hosting this tonight. It's a great turnout. We're so pleased everyone's here. Um, I think that this question goes back to the fact that I don't want to eliminate any programs either. Uh, the most important thing we do as a, as a school board member is maintain the whole child. We need to view each child in their whole as, as an entity. And you know, just as some of my uh, the candidates have said. Some people have certain strengths more than others, and you need to tap into those strengths to make those, make those children just shine. Um, the way we have done it in the past is we've just gotten just plain creative. We coined a term a couple of years ago called frugal innovation, where we really try to maximize every penny and try to make sure we're doing the right things at the right time. And by being creative, it means working with our delegation and letting them know that this is important to our community. And if it means that we contact parents, school improvement councils, PTAs, and say, help us with this, that's what we need to do. A couple of years ago, uh, we had some issues with the music program and athletics just because the economy was so down. And we heard loud and clear from our parents, do everything possible to maintain these programs. And I think that's the one thing we're so good at is we listen <coughs> and we truly try to mesh with the community, be creative, and really keep the programs going because we need to do that for our students. Thank you. I'm Ted Z. The programs I feel that should be protected in tough budget times are the courses that are required for graduation such as math, ELA, science, social studies, world language, fine arts, computer science, and PE, all requirements for graduation. Right, right now, as the school district stands, I see the centers of studies being most at risk because it is not a requirement for graduation. It costs money for transportation and to run these programs. Also at risk would be the fringe programs such as transportation to sporting events. I think they've cut middle school back to one bus for football games used to run to, and any of the elective classes. Um, classes at the elementary and middle school that are required by state law must be protected. The year my son was to take driver education, was dropped from the curriculum. Inconvenient, yes. Required for graduation, no. Uh, luckily, there was a private company that was able to provide the services. So, that's my answer. Thank you.
I did not feel that Lexington wants you to explore the option of year-round school. Extend the school day. How much longer do you want our kids to go to school? Each school is required to provide, provide the equivalent of six hours of instruction per day for 30 hours over a one-week period. When you're adding travel time and lunch, most children are away from home eight to nine hours a day. How much longer do our kids need to go to school? The only time we should consider to extend the school day is when we're trying to make up an excessive amount of missed school days. This would only be temporary in order to make up instructional time and only when we have exhausted our severe weather makeup days and do not want to extend the school year. question because this is a really good question. I'm not opposed to year-round schooling, but I will be honest, in my 12 years on the board, I, I maybe have only had three people ask me about it. I don't know that it's really something this community wants. No, I'm not saying they don't, it's not a great, good thing, great thing, but I'm not sure this is exactly what fits our community, and I think it would be real important for the school board to put feelers out and if the community wanted year-round schooling, let us know that so that we could accommodate that. I do have friends in Tennessee who absolutely love it. And I, we just had a friend uh, just moved to North Carolina, and I thought this was really interesting. They did the elementary and the middle school are on year-round, but the high school is not. And guess why? Because they can't manage football games on Friday nights across the state one district's on year-round and the rest are not. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. But like I said, we would listen to the community and if that is what the community wanted, we would definitely do that. As far as extended day, that is a totally different ball of wax because you are talking about asking the teachers to work more hours. And as of right now, we do not have the funding to compensate them. Just as in the private sector, you would, if you were asked to work 10 or 20 hours more, you would hope to be compensated for that, and we do not have the funding for that. So I do think there are occasions where extended day would be a great thing, but we would need funding to accommodate that. Thank you, thank you, Lauren. So I do think it's an interesting question. Um, you know, when you look at any business, you have a, a fixed asset, a fixed cost. Um, I mean, for the school district, our biggest costs are our labor costs for teachers and then our facility or our plant. So the upside to going to year-round school is you're using your physical plant, which we're all paying taxes for, in a more um, uh, resource utilization manner. It's being used around the year. Now, that being said, culturally, that's a cold shower to most of us because we like our summers with our kids. You know, we like our two-week Christmas break. Um, and uh, like Cindy, I uh, actually have family in North Carolina, and my first cousin, her and her family, are in a year-round school. And it's been interesting over the past couple of years hearing her talk about it. Now, she actually went into it with some trepidation. But now that she's in it, she's actually really enjoying it. Because as a family, every two to three months, they take a week vacation. She's seen her, the progression of her children and how they don't lose that two and a half, three month break or window during the summer. Um, uh, and have to catch up the next month or two of the, of the next school year. And so she's actually seen her kids progress quicker through school and they're actually able to tackle um, more subjects. And then as a district, they're able to fund more things because they're using their asset, this building, and all our buildings, in a more resource-focused way. That being said, that's my personal take on it. Again, with a uh, degree of change of this magnitude, um, with the work I've done at the hospital, um, I've learned that you have to have a large guiding coalition. So this, no matter what one person or one board thinks, can't be done with grassroots support from the community. And again, I think it comes to need. What's the urgency to do this? Why are we doing this? So again, if we continue to stay in this recession, and we continue to look at shortages of funding, and it means losing teachers or whatever it may mean, then I think we will continue to have to be creative to think of ways to keep our kids engaged. Thank you. I thought long and hard about this question because I know the pros and I know the cons. But I think the cons outweigh having an extended day or an year-round school. What happens is the child will lose interest with an extended day if the class goes forever. The parent will be tired of the child going to school 
all year round because they can't take a four day weekend if they have a break at work. They have to be at home waiting for the school day to get over and not having anything to do except on a two day weekend. Um, childhood is short enough without changing school. Our children need to be children. They need the freedom to find fun things to do, plus reading, plus drawing, whatever they do in the summertime. I know it was the best time of the year for my kids, and as a working parent, I only had so much time that I could get away. Christmas is hard enough. You got two weeks to make sure your child that's at home has a responsible person watching them. So for me, an all year round school, no. Extended day, there are enough programs that take the day and extend the school day. So I wouldn't extend it. I understand that uh, both of these concepts are somewhat foreign to us because we are sort of wedded to a traditional school schedule where we attend for a certain number of months a year and get the summers off. I really think the key to these concepts is uh, at least uh, taking a look at them and, and considering them. Year-round school, there's some advantages. There's no increase in the number of days um, in terms of attendance demands. Um, the, the biggest benefit I see in terms of year-round school for students is that you uh, are able to maintain retention skills a lot better uh, during the year-round schedule as opposed to perhaps losing some skills over an extended uh, summer period. Again, and I talked with a reporter about this uh, this week on the phone, there are no plans on the board for Lexington District 1 to go to a year-round school, and I want everyone to be aware of that. One challenge associated with it is the fact that it would be very difficult, I think, in the state of South Carolina from a logistical perspective, for one district uh, by itself to go to a year-round schedule and other districts not do that and it creates that difficulty that we talk about in terms of scheduling not only for athletic contests but for other types of competition that students are involved in. Extended school day, that's another issue because as there have been increased demands on core subjects for students, what happens traditionally is that other avenues of learning for students or other programs for students have a tendency to get crowded out. And so you have, again, a reduction in emphases on arts um, and possibly athletics. And so there, there could be some advantages to extending the school day to give students the opportunities that they need to be well-rounded and to deal with that whole student. But again, those plans, I want to make clear, are not on the board for Lexington School District 1 at this point in time. I think it's something we would need to study. I think it's something we would need community input, uh, a lot of input and feedback from you to tell us what you would expect and what you would desire uh, for yourselves and for your students. Thank you. extended day program, I look at, especially on the high school level, that we already have extended the day for many students, especially those who participate in uh, fine arts, sometimes band, practices long, long hours after school, the band orchestra and chorus can have those extended days, those who participate in athletics, those who participate in clubs and activities associated uh, especially with our career areas where they have contests and so forth. But there is one program that we have found very successful that it does extend the school day for a small group of students. And at the high school level, you are very interested in getting that ready, for, that student ready to get that high school diploma. And he falls behind, especially in those core areas of English and math, which are critical to them being promoted to the next grade, earning the number of units they need to get to the next grade. We had implemented some programs if they get behind in their classes and they're identified and have the option to come to some after school programs that will assist them in catching up with those skills and redoing some of the work they have not done up to standard in their classroom. And that has worked very effective for us. Again, it's not for everybody, but it is for selected students. So I'd say we would look at this program in terms of where the needs are, what needs to be met, and if 
it does provide a valuable service to our students, and especially, I say, in the area of getting the required English to the next grade so they can get that high school diploma at the end of four years. It's very successful. Uh, I have been a part of um, looking at a new school day. And uh, when we looked at it and looked at the year-round school concept, it was very similar to what we've already heard before. And the main reason, again, was athletics. You know, you don't have a football season in the spring. And so that was the reason, and I don't think we need to, uh, to go that route. I think there are other better schedules for that. Extending the school day or year-round school, why would you do it or why would you not? First of all, it comes down to a student need, a parental need, an academic need. I believe that our students are at school, just like Ms. Hagan said, I, I don't know about anyone else, I can only take my personal experience. My daughter, my oldest daughter in 10th grade, is at school at 7.30 in the morning. She's not there because she has to attend a class. She's there because she's either beta club, or some other activity. She's also picked up tutoring students on her own, and she goes to class, she goes to school at 7.30, meets those students. She has three students right now that she's assisting with biology and chemistry, algebra. That's her choice. She's also involved in athletics. My oldest one in 10th grade, she is at school until 5.30 in the afternoon, every day. My youngest, seventh grade, she's at practice until six o'clock. That makes a long day for a child. A long day for a child. Year-round schools have been proven in South Carolina because I did do some research and I found where in South Carolina it's a, a failure. 26% of the public schools for a regular year that have high academic achievements on standardized testing and then 30, 13%, which is two out of the 16, with Palmetto Gold or Silver, Schools that have been doing five years of year-round school don't change. The children do not have, for pros and cons, the year-round school does not help them academically in order to have them burned out of school. We have a lot of issues with children with dropout rates as it is. So I believe that those children could be caught up in some other fashion. My child has children come to school, she helps them. And I do believe that year-round school would not benefit the child as much as it would hurt the child. Thank you. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> I don't know about your son or your children, but my child leaves the house a few minutes after seven in the morning and does not return home until about 4.20 in the afternoon. So I feel that extending the school day would be detrimental to him because he's already gone long enough. And then he has homework to do in the evening as well as chores and dinner. And the day is just not long enough to add additional time in the classroom. And as far as year-round school, there has been studies on both sides of that coin. Um, the benefit of year-round schooling is to help the continuity of the learning to where you don't miss the, the downfall of the summer months where your test scores in the um, fall are always reduced from the test scores in the spring due to the summer months and the lack of academic studies during that time frame. So therefore, year-round schooling would be beneficial for that. But we have the other side of that coin. The tourism industry drives a lot of when school starts back. They were the changing force when we changed when school began a few years ago to where we had to wait till the third week of August, and they were the driving force behind that so the families could vacation longer during the summer in the month of August. Thank you. Thank you. Look at the first
first part of this question is this, should we explore, as the Lexington County, or Lexington One School Board, that would be our job to explore. And I'm willing to explore anything that will give our students a leg up. That's not to say that I'm going to endorse it or knee-jerk against it, but that would be our job, is to look into it, determine if it's something that could work, and then present to the community and say, here's what we think, this is what we did, and we did our due diligence and say, yes, it could work, or no, it couldn't work. As far as a longer school day goes, if you look at some of the charter schools and magnet schools across the country, that's what they're doing is longer school days. So at some point, we've got to make the decision, what do we want for our kids? Do we, just, we don't want to be burdened, and we'll just keep doing what we're doing, and that'll be okay, or we got to figure something out. There's got to be some kind of compromise, because where we are right now with the day we have, it's obviously not enough. Um, a longer day is shown to uh, engage students more in learning. They build deeper relationships with their teachers. They get to explore some of these subjects in a deeper way. Um, they have more access to the arts and other Michigan classes. As far as the extended school year, as a couple other people back there, it's not exactly, it's not necessarily more days, it's just shorter breaks. And there has been studies on both sides of the ball, but one study that does stand out is Johns, Hop Johns Hopkins did studies showing that as much as two thirds of the achievement gap of lower income kids comes from the fact that they have a longer summer break. So again, we've got to make a determination. What do we care about? Do we care about closing these gaps? Because if we do, it's going to take some effort on our part. And it's, it's going to be inconvenient. I mean, there's, there's going to be hard times that we've got to decide what is important. If these things are important, then we have to make sacrifices. Um, I'm going to go over just a little bit because I think Ms. Hagman went over just a couple of seconds. <laughs> just kidding. Um, I do not feel that we need to extend the school day, nor do we need to have year-round school. Our students are learning in our district. I think not only with the students, we need to give our teachers a break too. Those teachers are in that classroom all day with the students. Likewise, the students are in the classrooms with the teachers. Those teachers work very hard to make our students what they are, very hard. And the teachers need a break. And I think um, Ms. Smith said that um, Tennessee had year-round school. And I'm not quite sure, but I don't think they have property taxes either. Um, Whereas we do. But no, I do not think that we need to extend the school day or the school year. Thank you. After all that intellectual calculative responses from people, I just want to say, make it very simplified. Having such program in place is completely disaster. My dad was a doctor. He made sure that you know we had enough rate rest and we are not suffer from fatigue syndrome the thing is keep nature in mind we as a human being we when we become so intellectual we tend to realize that we are running away from a reality even though we live in denial but we are so persistent our persistence toward our goal that you know we do not want to accept the fact what is the fact if i want to send my child like you know i send my child to india for like seven weeks i cannot do that I was in Charleston the other day and like you know we were riding the carriage and they told the Tony the mural, it's a fantastic mural, he works very hard for four weeks. Every four weeks he get two weeks vacation. He goes on the farm and plays. Keep that in mind. I mean, you know, it is completely inadequate for having such program. I mean, you know, that's what we invent the machines for. So therefore, the program or even thought of having such type of activities or such program is not right.
this one, so maybe it won't take all my time. But uh, I always look at vouchers and tuition tax credits as taking money away from our public schools. And um, then it goes to certain schools or in certain ways that um, there's no accountability. And so some people look at the fact, you know, well, they maybe are doing a better job in the public schools, but they don't have the accountability that we have in the public schools. Um, not all of these schools even have to accept all of the students. We are obligated as a public school system to accept all the students, everybody that comes to our door. Um, I think maybe some of the um, pros of for some of these types of schools of using vouchers and you having checks, checks, having tuition tax credits to go to another school is that it does open up some additional school choices for our young people. And I'd be the first to say that uh, we want choices, we want options for our children. And so it, there are good things about them in that they can provide additional options for them to form and to work and to be in another environment than the public school system. appreciate this question very much. Let me tell you that unequivocally that I oppose vouchers or any type of backdoor voucher such as tuition tax credits. You'll hear a lot of people tell you that vouchers will create choice for families. The truth of the matter is that vouchers create choice for private schools. Private schools, you can show up at their door with the money in hand and they still do not have to accept your student. If your student does not fit the profile of that private school, they do not have to accept your student. And many times vouchers and tuition tax credits are just a drop in the bucket in terms of what it costs for a private school education. My biggest concern with the voucher uh, initiative is the fact that it forces taxpayers to support two educational systems. And Ms. Hager has already mentioned to you that um, one system has to conduct their business in an open forum. One system has to be accountable to the public. One system has to hire highly qualified teachers. The other system has to do none of that. There is no accountability to the public from the private schools uh, associated with, with these vouchers. And um, also in terms of capacity, 90% of the students uh, in South Carolina are in public education. Uh, that tells you that the private schools don't, don't even have the capacity to deal with the number of students that exist or that are receiving educational services here in the state of South Carolina. So the, the whole voucher movement has been an interesting movement. I think it's been an attempt to discredit to a large degree what goes on in our public schools. And I think um, any kind of voucher program uh, is a real travesty. And again, it places the choice not with families. It places the choice with the private schools that will be honoring those vouchers. Thank you. With vouchers and tax credits, I'm on the fence. I grew up in a private school and I didn't ever find one school that turned away a student for need. The tax credits, I've talked to homeschooled parents and they say they don't want the tax credit, so the public school is welcome to it. The reason they don't want it, they don't want the government telling them how to teach their children or what to teach them. If a voucher gives a child a better chance for a better education, then where they want to go needs to consider, can we fit them in? How far behind are they to our school district? I think that's the only ifs and buts with it. Other than that, we need to watch school choice and see where it grows. So the fun part of these forums, especially the format of this one, is one question we're all answering. Our other forums we all have been answering individual questions. So I actually mirror some of the comments that have been said. Uh, I do not support uh, school vouchers. Um, again, uh, but let me add from the community perspective why I don't. Uh, from the student perspective, I reiterate the comments that have been made. But essentially vouchers 
pulled money out of the public school system to engage charter schools and private schools. Now, I personally believe that the public school system is the backbone of our community. It's why parents move here. It's why businesses locate here. It's also the heart and soul of our community. It's where we come together on Friday nights. It's where on Saturdays and Sundays we come together to celebrate the performing arts. So if you're going to defund essentially the backbone and part of your community, then you're reducing funding for your community and you're shifting that money elsewhere. Now, as a homeowner, I've benefited from the desirability of our community people moving here. My property tax, in theory, I mean, our property value hasn't dropped relative to the rest of the state. Businesses that are here have benefited from the strong public school system. Um, the restaurants, the hotels, you pick it. Uh, and even the manufacturing businesses have, have prospered because of our strong public school system. Because parents come here because they want to raise their kids here. And qualified parents who care about their kids' education lease some qualified public schools. So again, going down the road of funding or taking money out of the public school system, in my mind, defunds your community. And, and I, I won't support it. Credits. It is unbelievable the money that is being poured into the state from out, out of state to bring tax credits and vouchers into our state. And the reason they're doing it is because they want to create for profit schools. And they want to take that money, they want you to enroll your child, then they want you to take a subsequent loan because that money is never quite enough. And they want you to go to a school where the teachers do not have to be accredited, where there is no accountability, and just as several other people have said, your child doesn't necessarily have to be accepted because they may not meet the profile of that particular school. We're, we're experiencing it now in the military. There is a, there is a tax credit um, voucher system in the military, and they give vets returning from Iraq and Afghanistan money to go to college. And so you've seen these colleges that have popped up all over Columbia, and you've also seen the commercials that say, if you're a returning vet, get your money, come over here. Well, General Petraeus' wife has made this her personal cause. She is so appalled at what these for-profit colleges are doing to our young men and women. They're coming out with degrees they don't need. They're in so much debt, and now they want to push it to the K-12 level. So just from what I've witnessed, I do not support that. Thank you.
just short and to the point, um, I, I agree with everyone else. I do not support vouchers and, and tax tuition credits, any, anything that takes away from our public education, I do not support. I guess the, the short part of that would be, no, I don't support that. And I think we need to look at why this is an issue year after year after year. And one of the biggest reasons is the people in this country have seen us throw money at education more and more every year as if that's going to be the answer. And suddenly our kids are going to overtake every other country and everything will be fine. At the local level, we've seen obscene amounts of money spent. At this very level, because last year, when you take out for what we spend on adult programs, and any community programs, we spent over $326 million. At 22,781 students, that's $14,000 per student. They don't want to give you that number. They don't believe all of a sudden that building schools and the bonds and the debt that we took out, all of a sudden that doesn't count towards per student. It, it does count. That's what we spent. That's money we spent. That's one of the biggest problems is people look at how much money we spent and then look at how much private schools spend per student and go, wow, that's a stark difference. Fourteen thousand compared to, I believe it's something around forty-five hundred dollars. That's a huge difference. Yeah, private schools don't have the same issues that public schools do. They don't have to worry about transportation and things like that. But there's a stark difference there in how much money. And more money does not equal better education. It obviously doesn't because we're spending more and more and more, and we're falling further and further behind in the world. As far as vouchers go, based on what I've read, um, they, they tend to only help in the inner city um, minorities. They're the only group that has shown that positively has shown a, an effect on them where 24% of them are more likely to go to college. That's not a huge issue for us here. We're not in the inner city, we're pretty rural. But again, I'd be against it, but the only reason why I'm against it is because I think we can change the mindset and make people trust back in public education. There is a lot of controversy around the tuition tax credits and the vouchers. Um, pros and cons on both sides of the fence. But what a lot of people don't realize is there's already laws in place that allow for certain tax deductions already, especially when you have a child with disabilities. For example, if you have a special needs student, you send him to a private school, uh, we have a couple here in the area, they have a medical ID number, you get them to deduct. 100% of the tuition from your taxes, so therefore you're lowering the tax basis collected in the community for income taxes. Um, there's also a program between school districts and the South Carolina Department of Ed for cost sharing. And there's usually approximately $300,000 or more spent every year between agreements with school districts and private schools at taxpayer expense. So there's already some things that are out there. Um, and so there has not been legislation at this point that would increase the educational opportunities for all students because the rates are, are just not possible. So, we need to leave the money in the public education system. Thank you. Thank you. I guess my viewpoint is about the same as everyone else that's running for the board. If you're on the board, you support, you love public education. I know that I'm a product of public education. My brothers, sisters are. My husband and my children will be too. I believe parental involvement is the key. Teachers, schools, and parental involvement. Um, I do believe that it's always discussed in the House, and this year in April, that the voucher was passed by the House. They also came up with a cost of $37 million in general funds that would affect our school systems if people took advantage of this system. So like I said, I, I just did it what everyone else has said. I do not believe that this would be a, a good choice 
for our children. Thank you. There's pros and cons to increasing class sizes, and I'll look at both. Um, with the financial needs of what we have going on around with us now, there may be some instance that we have to increase class size. It's also been proven that unless you dis decrease class sizes by seven or more students per class in early years, early education, elementary school years, that there's not that dramatic of an effect. So I believe that in financial distress, there may come a time, and I don't know if this board has done it in the past or not, but I know that, that other boards have increased the class size by a few students. If you do that, you also may be prone to have to lay a teacher off. I'm not in support of that either. Thank you. Increasing class sizes. In my opinion, we do not need to increase the class sizes any larger. They're already at um, approximately 24 to 1. Um, we already have classes that are overcrowded, and some of the students are not getting the individualized attention from the teachers. If anything, we must reduce class sizes and put more teachers in the classrooms. In order to deal with the funding limitations, we need to increase the ratio for the district office administrator to pupils. This is becoming more a reality because we have reached the 50% poverty level in the district of children that are free and reduced lunches and are Medicaid eligible. In 2011, the number of out of school suspensions or expulsions increased by 1%. So therefore, I think we need to decrease the size. Thank you. I think I'll echo a lot of what Nan just said. In my opinion, increasing class size would be a very last resort after every other thing didn't work. When you add more kids, you're adding more stress, you're adding more work on teachers that have enough to deal with. I've been a substitute here in, in this school district. It's hard to manage class on any level. When you're adding kids to that, you're only making it harder for the teachers. The ratios in this district are already pretty high in my opinion. District-wide is 22 to 1, and in the high schools, anywhere from 25 to 30 to 1. That's a lot of people for one person to be in charge of. We need to cut everything we can in order to avoid issues like that. And there's plenty of things out there we can cut. Um, it may take a lot of time to come through all the paperwork, but I promise you, if you go through and actually look at some of these budget documents, you'll find there's things we can cut to make that a very last resort. The last thing we ever do is put more work and stress on people. Okay, I too am not in favor of increasing class sizes. Um, I think what we need to do, if we need to help fund or work with the funding limitations, I think the first thing we need to do in any case in our district is start at the top. Um, if we have to make cuts, we need to cut pay at the district office first and not with the teachers in our classrooms and not increase class sizes. Thank you. Increasing class sizes. If this is not a very good idea. Rather what we should do is make this place more inviting in terms of encourage businesses. When we moved to South Carolina from New York, I went to I wanted to open a patisserie and lingerie with having some imported cheese from France, Switzerland, and all that. Some people say, oh my gosh, what is that? 
So if you know, so that's where what we need to do, open our mind to the world of opportunities. You know, the next is a great place, but make sure there is a lot of things out in the world. Because you know, I travel, I have another business in China. When I go there and when I come back, I feel honestly, and I'll be very honest with you, because one thing I learned from some of my peers, speak your mind, because this is not the political debate. And if it's not the political debate, it is going to help our children, our community. So increase something, make this place more inviting so people will come, we don't have to advertise. Do something so more people will come here and they will choose the place, it will be a destination place. So therefore we will have enough funding and not having to have this class increase. Thank you. I feel that dealing this increasing class size to deal with funding limitations will be a disservice to our students. I was thinking about other alternatives before increasing class size. Student achievement needs to be the number one priority of our school board. We also need to make sure that when we have large scale program changes, that doesn't also have a negative effect on class size. Thank you. are increasing this year and so we're real excited about that because uh, about four or five years ago we did go up two students in every class we also furloughed our teachers we did we really got out of the box because the revenues were so low and they are coming back up and it looks like next year we'll, we will be able to add uh, we will be able to reduce <coughs> each class by two students and we try so hard to keep our eye on our students make sure that they have personalized learning. Um, if we want every child to have a personalized plan, and the way to do that is to have smaller classes so that we can know where, they are, where their gaps are and where their successes are, and we can really work with those kids. You know, it's interesting. I think anyone who's been in a classroom, has taught a classroom, knows the value of small class sizes. Um, but the reality is, is we're in probably the worst depression most of us in this room have experienced. And we have 500 students per year that are coming to our school district. And the district, you've heard the stats, has grown from 11,000 to 22, 23,000. So that's the reality we face. So although it'd be nice to say, let's not increase class sizes, the reality is that we have to meet the needs of those kids. And you either turn kids away, which is not an option for a public school system, you increase class sizes, or you hire more teachers and tell all your teachers that you're going to pay all of them less. And that's a hard thing to do. As a worker myself, I don't want to be told we'll be doing the same work for less money. And lastly, and something we haven't highlighted here, use alternative uh, funding. So if you haven't learned about the Lexington District One Foundation, you need to. It is uh, a foundation, a uh, charitable giving vehicle for people in our community to give money so that it can fund programs of the district. And that's a great way to keep programs up and running and to not distract or take away from teacher salary. So take a look at that. I'm not in favor of increasing class size. First of all, the student wants to realize that their teacher is talking to them, not just the whole class. The teacher not only has a nine hour day in the classroom, she also has about six hours that she's working on the paperwork that came from the children in those classes. If we have to increase the number of children, and hopefully we can decrease, according to Ms. Smith, then our teachers will have time to spend on more innovation in the classroom and in, in order to help the slow learners and the quick learners learn. All the data shows that students perform better in smaller schools, and they perform better in schools that are in classrooms and have good student-teacher ratios. And so that has always been something that, as a board, we've tried to avoid, if at all possible. Um, as Ms. Smith indicated just a few uh, minutes ago, there were times uh, when we had to deal with severe budget cuts from the state level that forced us to uh, deal with the issue of, of classroom size. And, and again, that's not ideal for us, and it was a last resort effort for us. And our intention is to 
make those student-teacher ratios the best that they possibly can be. I will tell you again, though, I, I have to say that the real issue here is making certain that our funding sources, both from state and federal perspective, keep their funding promises to school districts so that we don't have to cut and cut and cut and ultimately lose the character of who we are as a district. That is something that nobody wants. Uh, so get out there and talk to those elected officials and tell them to keep their funding promises to local school districts. Thank you. I remember those years when we had to have the increase in the number of students in the classroom, and it was very disheartening for the teachers. And what I knew as an administrator at that time, it was affecting the quality of the education for each individual student. When a teacher has that kind of right number of students in the classroom, and it can vary from class to class is what the optimum number is, uh, they then have the time to have one-on-one -on -one instruction with those students. They also have the time to provide adequate feedback so students know where they are and then adequate feedback to that parent. And that's what's critical for a student to have a quality education. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It's been such a pleasure, and thank you. Um, why? Uh, like, my experiences, I was born in India, went to school in India, I lived in UK, moved to New York, um, we manage entity in Southeast Asia. The, you know, with exposure, my main thing is invest in education, invest your effort, invest your time, invest your talent, whatever you have. The, the, one of the most important tools in life is like, you know, we are working, we are working to our children, we are working for them. Therefore, let's get our personal goals aside, let's get our personal agenda and invest ourselves where we can make a better society. We are living in the 21st century and the thing is what is going on in the world, a lot of people have no idea, but the thing, if you get everyone together, sit down and achieve a common goal to, 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 to make something for our children.
other than what goes on inside the school. Um, my full-time job allows me, because I work 24-hour shifts, I have a lot of free time during the week that I can be in these schools and talk to these teachers and find out what's working and what's not working. Because that's the way we're going to make these bit better from the inside out. Um, I'm not going to lie on other people, maybe administrators, to tell me how things are going. I need to find that out from the teachers. Um, I'm committed to getting this district to be globally competitive. It's not enough to say we're going to be globally competitive and create 21st century graduates and hand my iPad and say, that's it, that's all we got to do. In 2020, I'm going to have 100, oh, never mind. Hi there, my name is Janet Ballard Frazier. I'm originally from Augusta, Georgia. I have been in Lexington County for 17 years. I have uh, three children. My youngest son is a seventh grader at Meadow Glen Middle School. My husband, Russell Frazier, is from Gilbert, South Carolina. And no, we're not related to Danny Frazier. I just have to throw that out, because everybody asked. I've met very many people that didn't ask. Um, I have been employed in the private sector for 13 years, and I have been employed in the federal sector for 23 years, and I have extensive human resource background, budget finance background, um, contracting, and I want to represent the taxpayers of Lexington School District 1, um, increase accountability, increase transparency, and put more money in the classroom for the teachers. And I would appreciate your support on November the 6th. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Rhonda Wanamaker Gunter. My children, my husband, and I are all privates of Lexington County Schools, Lexington 1 Schools. I believe that I am the right person for this job. One of the reasons is my work experience. I've worked for South Carolina Probation Parole and Pardon Services, BabyNet, that's a program through DHEC that focuses on children that are born with special needs, begins at birth until school age. The School for Deaf and Blind. I'm currently part-time employed at Pillion Town Hall with the Police Department, and I'm clerk of court for Victim Services. I'd be honored to serve as a Lexington One school board member. I believe that one of the things that would help me tremendously is my seven years experience on another Lexington County school board. I picked up a lot of information talking with legislators, people. I'm a people person. Someone that is on the school board needs to be approachable, not just by administrators, but by parents, by children, by everyone. That's where you find out where your problems are. Thank you. I bring some school experience uh, to this position and will bring the school experience to this position. I've been a teacher, I've been a guidance counselor, I've been an assistant principal, and I've been a principal. So I, I know as a principal the everyday running of a school, and uh, I feel like all of that is going to be valuable experience for me to bring to this school board. I've also had the privilege of serving on the executive committee of the high school league, and the high school league does govern uh, public uh, school sports uh, in our state, and uh, I feel like that is an aspect. While I'm, I was never a good player, you know, I tried to play basketball, but they're good at that, but I do bring the experience of how we do govern uh, athletics in South Carolina, and uh, I would be privileged to serve, it would be a privilege of mine and an honor to serve on your school board. I don't want to violate the rules, but before you start my timer, could we get some applause for those fine musicians that entertained us uh, tonight? <laughs> uh, my name is Edwin Harmon, and I'm a product of the Lexington School District 1, as are most of my family members. And I think I'm a strong candidate for this school board because of my experience and what I believe in. I've served on this board for the last 12 years. It's been an honor for me to do so. I have served as board chair and vice chair. I have served as a federal relations network representative for this board for the last 10 years. It allows me to go to Washington, D.C. and advocate not only for Lexington District 1, but for public education in general. And I have achieved level six in South Carolina 
School Boards Association's Boardsmanship Institute, which represents literally hundreds of hours of training in terms of school governance, uh, roles and responsibility of board members, uh, school finance, all those sorts of things. But let me tell you what I believe in. I'm rooted in Lexington District 1, and Lexington District 1 is rooted in me. I believe in maintaining the excellence that's been a hallmark of this district since its inception in 1952. I believe in our 21st century initiatives because I believe that we need to produce individuals who can compete in a 21st century global economy. But let me tell you what I believe in more than anything. I believe in our students and our parents. We've had tremendous support from our parents during my 12 years on this board, and I can't thank you enough for that. And I do covet your vote on November 6th. Thank you. You can make all the notes you want, but when it comes down to the final minute, I'm Deb Kelderman. I have 30 years experience in the informa information technology field. I am responsible for a lot of innovation. I work for Siemens PLM. Why do I want to be on the board? Why do I want you to vote for me? I'll be the watchdog who watches the pennies. I'll make sure that the innovations that the teachers need to help their students are implemented. I'll make sure iBooks are implemented. And I will do my best to listen to you when you have thoughts that need to be done by the school board. Thank you. Thank you again for having this forum, but I'm Brett Powers. Um, let me first tell you first and foremost that I'm a believer. I'm a member of Mount Horb United Methodist Church where I'm active both in our adult small group ministries and in our, and our children ministries. I'm a husband of 16 years and I'm a proud father of three beautiful daughters. Emma Grace, who's in fifth grade, Bryce, who's in second grade, and Molly, who's a fourth grader when we started, four years old when we started kindergarten next year. I'm a current parent at Rocky Creek Elementary School and a future parent at Pleasant Hill Middle and Lexington High School. I'm also a physician in our community. I've been at Lexington Medical Center as a practicing internist for the past eight years. For the past four years, I've been part of our leadership team and currently serve in the role of Chief Medical Officer. In that role, I have to reach compromise between some 600 physicians, some 6,000 employees, as we deliver care with just under 1 million patient encounters. I'll bring that experience, I'll bring that insight to the school district, and I'll be your ambassador to our community. Thank you. I've been a leader in our district for the past 12 years, and every decision I have made, I have put your children first. I've done this while being fiscally responsible and while being mindful of the needs of the community because we are a whole and we all need to work together. I have worked tirelessly, I can tell you that. In the past 12 years of the 144 school board meetings that we have scheduled, I have never missed a single meeting, nor has Dr. Harmon. We both live to serve and believe in what we're doing. My own two children are successful Lexington One graduates. They are now teachers. My oldest daughter is a first year teacher down in the Low Country, and my youngest daughter is an English teacher with the Peace Corps over in the Philippines. Just this year, we received an A on our district report card, and Advanced Ed came in, an outside consulting firm, and told us we were the best district they had ever reviewed. I love what I do, I love working with the children, I love working with the students. I truly want to prepare your children for career, work, and life, and I hope that you will vote for me, Cindy Smith, on November 6th. Thank you. I believe I am qualified candidate because I have served on Pleasant Hill Middle School School Approval Council. I served as its chairman twice. As a council, we worked on less legislative issues such as funding flexibility, and we studied Act 388. I served on the district's government relations committee and the superintendent's parent advisory, parent advisory council. I also served on the community schools facility study committee. I was a substitute teacher over a two-year period that gave me great perspective with, from within the classroom through the eyes of a teacher, and it also helped me understand the student. I will bring a balanced perspective to the school board because not only do I have two children who attend the school in the district, but I also provide landscaping services to many of the residents in our district, as well as employ former Lexington One grads. I'm a small business owner and homeowner. 
I should get your vote because I will make student achievement my number one priority, closely followed by protecting the interests of the taxpayer. As a watchdog for our community on taxes and school programs, I will be accessible to the public and will hold myself accountable. I will make sure students receive the best education for the tax dollars spent. And my goals will be to keep village in check. And I have other goals that are on Facebook. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, in conclusion, I've got three little thank yous I'm going to take care of real quick. First and foremost, we all are people of the community. We have business schedules. And I want to thank everybody in the audience for coming out tonight and taking time out of your personal schedule to meet with these people. I really do. I thank you. Secondly, I want to thank the educational leaders at Lexington, one that put this program together. Uh, without them, this wouldn't have happened. It wasn't, I had nothing to do with it. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to thank the candidates for their passion for our children. That's huge right now. Uh, and these people do have their hearts for the kids. And I, I want to thank them for coming and taking time out of your schedule to talk to us about important issues. I want to thank you. And finally, Don't forget to go out and vote. It doesn't matter. Thank you.